we welcome you to worship on this second day, second Sunday after Easter. And this day that we reflect on God's wonderful creation, which we call Earth Sunday. We pray and trust that the Lord will continue to bless our worship. The Lord will continue to guide us. And the Lord will continue to inspire in us the desire to keep the world and to renew his creation. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 98. Psalm 98 verse 4 says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lie and with the lie and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord of laws. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you with joy. We come to you with gratitude because you are our maker. We come to praise you and we ask that you will cleanse our worship and accept it as a sacrifice. We give you our bodies. We give you our hearts. We ask that you will take us, take us, mold us until we are completely conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things with thanksgiving and together all God's people say, Amen, Amen. We continue with our worship in song. Would you please stand if you are able? Mercy and justice, you'll reign at your Father's side. 
and the angels will cry,
Thank you. You may be seated. As we mentioned the last week, we are returning to full in-person worship at Monocacy Valley Church beginning next Sunday, May the 2nd. Our worship band will once again be up on stage leading us in live worship music. I'd like to remind everyone as well that even though we are back to full in-person worship, we will still be practicing the common sense COVID prevention methods such as mask wearing and social distancing. Also next week, we will be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. To support our in-person worship, we are looking for volunteers to help us back in the booth with sound, video, and multimedia. It's really easy to learn and we will train you. If you are interested in volunteering, please speak to one of the pastors or to me, Mark Mulholland, in the sound booth after worship this morning. Our in-person fellowship and Bible study meets Monday, April 26th at 7 p.m. Our virtual ministries that are on Zoom consist of the Cancer Support Group, which meets every Friday at 10 a.m., the men's Bible study that meets on Saturday, May the 1st at 8.30 a.m., and the women's Bible study that meets Thursday evening, May 13th at 7 p.m. You may send your tithes and offerings via a check or on our tithe.ly online giving site that you'll find on our Facebook page and website or you may simply leave your tithes and offerings in the basket as you enter the sanctuary. And please remember your donations to the Frederick Food Bank that you can leave right here at church. That makes a big difference in our community. And now, let's return to worship. this time I would like to pray for our children since it is 
only Micah and Rebecca here. You can stay. In, oh, okay. Then you can go with uh, Miss Lori in the nursery and continue with worship, okay? But some, listen to the word of God. Psalm 119 says, I have kept your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. And that psalm also says, the word of the Lord is a lamp unto my feet. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet. How can the word of God be a lamp to your feet, Michael? Do you know that? So, do you want to know? Good. So, <laughs> Miss Laura will teach you that in the nursery, okay? It's a secret. It's a secret. So she will teach you that in the nursery. How can you be scared of Miss Laurie? You know Miss Laurie very well. So shall we pray? Shall we pray? Father God in heaven, we thank you for Micah. We ask that he will not be scared anymore. But go and lend your word in the nursery. We ask all this with thanksgiving. Through Christ our Lord. And together all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Okay. So today is a good opportunity to have Miss Laurie. <laughs> For our scripture reading this morning, I invite you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 14. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 14, I read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. And in our prayers this week, I would like us to remember um, the following. Ralph is Susan Hansen's um, co-worker who is going through COVID-19. Also, let us remember Leah Pray for Leah and her brother. Leah will be donating um, stem cells to her brother Scott as Scott goes through cancer treatment. Um, Leah, is, she's not a member of our congregation, but they are friends of the Mulholland. Let us pray for these and other concerns. Loving God, we come before you with joy because you are in our midst. You spoke and said, where two or three are gathered in my name, you will be in their midst. So we acknowledge that. We acknowledge your presence. We acknowledge your leading. And we thank you for even some of the difficulties we are having with our technology this morning is all for your own glory. And we are glad that we are worshiping you despite those challenges. So Father, we ask that you will once again sanctify our worship and accept us. We thank you for this day and for the fact that we can pause as a denomination and as a church and reflect on the beauty of your creation. 
Help us to honor your creation and to steward the resources that you have placed in our care in such a way that we can maintain the honor and the dignity of your creation. We think of ways that we have exploited your gifts to us. We think of ways that we have contributed to the pollution of the rivers, the pollution of the atmosphere, mistreatment of animals, including humanity, and many other ways we ask for forgiveness, but ask for the grace to steward these resources for your own glory. Father God in heaven, as we pause this morning, we want to pray for those in leadership. Your word says all authorities are set up by you. We pray for world leaders, especially in countries and areas where there is anarchy. Would you please restore peace? Help those leaders or help our leaders, world leaders, to rule with your fear in mind. We remember the conflicts going on all over the world. In those hot spots, Lord, we pray for peace to reign. We pray for reconciliation. We pray that the gospel of truth will permeate those places and turn our eyes or people's eyes towards you. Lord, we have so much to thank you for, even in our congregation. Thank you for Promising Horizons Open House that was successful. And for those who have already indicated their willingness to enroll their children, Lord, we praise you for that. Yet we continue to ask that Promising Horizons would be a place where children will be children and will be taught the things of this world rooted in scripture so as to train them as they grow to grow with the world. Lord God in heaven, we also lift up other concerns. We thank you for Esther King for her final round of chemo last week, for the ways you have worked with her and how you have continued to assure her of your continuing presence and leadership. Uh, we trust you for healing. We rejoice for how far you have been with Brandon Tucker, yet more lies ahead and we ask that you will continue to surround him, give him peace, give him wisdom. We understand he's interested in you and you have continued to manifest yourself to him in ways that are amazing. So as he read your word and study your word, Lord God in heaven, we pray for the spirit of truth to give him guidance. The spirit of truth to provide illumination and you just be with him together with their entire family. Lord, we also pray for Ralph, Susan Hansen's co-worker who is COVID-19 positive. Lord, we pray that you will control their immune system and heal this family. Also, Leah Copper and her brother Scott as they go through cancer treatment in Boston this week. Lord, we pray for divine healing. Give guidance to the physicians so that they will do everything correctly. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide the process and bring healing. And there are many other people who are going through one illness or sickness or the other, we lift them up before you. Lord, this morning we ask that you will illumine this scripture for understanding and guide us, help us to live for you. We ask all this with thanksgiving and together all God's people say, 
Amen. Once again, as a church, we have been reflecting on Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 24, on the theme, Sword of the Spirit, Sword of the Spirit. Today, I would like us to look at an element under the Sword of the Spirit, that is the belt of truth buckled and the breastplate of righteousness as an instrument of the armor, or as a piece of the armor of God. The goal here is to help us resist evil. To resist evil. This issue touches on the core of Christianity. Evil. Every day we are faced with evil. Then how then, how can we resist evil when it is all around us? Evil is a factor of life and we are surrounded by it. How do we resist evil? Today's scripture is focused on those two principles. Truth and righteousness. Truth and righteousness. As elements of the sword of the spirit. The concept of sword of the spirit prompts this consideration. One, conflict with the devil is a spiritual battle that every Christian must face. It is different from a military warfare. That is, every Christian must face the enemy. Every Christian must face the enemy. We are not immune from being affected, affected by or being attacked by the enemy. That is principle number, observation number one. The second observation is the fact that when Paul was writing these words, Paul was in prison. And so Paul is here using um, instruments of war that resembles that of a Roman soldier. But the symbolism is virtues of faith in Christ. That is, Paul as a prisoner is calling for war, yet he is in chains. And the instruments of war are rather elements of a matured Christian life. This is what Paul is aiming at. This calls to mind what Jesus taught in the Gospel of Matthew, that our battle is not against the world, but against the evil. That our battles cannot be fought by carnal or earthly weapons. The implication is that we cannot engage the devil with man-made weapons, but with spiritual weapons. That is by standing firm on the faith and victory that is already wrought and won for us by Jesus Christ. That is where to stand. The third observation has to do with the fact or acknowledgement that we may not think that we are not in battle, but we are. Why is this important? It is important because the world will never, the whole world will never be favorable to the gospel of Christ. Christ told his disciples, as they have persecuted me, so they will persecute you. That is, we must not think the world will be favorable to the gospel of Christ, and that is what the devil wants. So we must anticipate hostility, but we should use the powers provided by Christ as seen in this gospel, I mean seen in this scripture, to confront Satan. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 14 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have the divine power to destroy strongholds, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Jesus Christ. That is Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. And so with that, our scripture says we should finally put on the whole armor of God, whole armor of God. But first of all, I'd like us to focus on one element of that armor. That is the belt of truth and righteousness. The belt of truth buckled around your waist is the first piece of armor given to us. 
The understanding is that we should restrain ourselves with truth. Restrain yourself. I should restrain myself with truth. A modern equivalent of this kind of birth is what? Seed birth. <laughs> or straps. Which are designed to secure our bodies from safety. Or for safety purposes. We must fasten ourselves with the truth. Fasten ourselves with the truth. Vehicle safety reports have supported the advantage of wearing seat belts, isn't it? <laughs> On the grounds that many fatalities have been reduced in cases of car crashes, the idea is that we should, in our case, fasten ourselves with truth. The belt held together the Roman soldier's clothing. It was a form of strap firming to the body, the military attire. The belt sheltered one sword getting ready for battle. Look at even our servicemen and women, especially police, with equipment fastened on their belt. So the belt, the Roman soldier's belt was strong enough to support other equipment. The belt was designed to keep every part of the armor in its place to restrain the soldier on every side. The flip side is that without the belt, then the soldier, the Roman soldier, was not ready. One cannot properly tuck his sword and important armor without the belt. And so in the same way, we are to bind ourselves with the truth. The question then is, what is truth? And what does this mean for us? In John, the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth, which means there is only one way or there is only one truth. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Unfortunately for us and in today's culture, truth is becoming more what? Relative. There is nothing like, for most people, nothing like absolute truth or objective truth. Truth, for most people, is independent. It is basically what you think, what I think, but Christ is the truth and the foundation of all truth. Proverbs 1.17 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Meaning, we can acquire knowledge through study, but wisdom comes from God. And there are some people who are very knowledgeable, isn't it? They are very knowledgeable, but they lack wisdom because of the absence of Christ or Christ as the center of their lives. We may be knowledgeable on things, very knowledgeable, but without Christ, we may lack the means to live by. And so Proverbs 117 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. We live in a world that is full of counterfeit. There are many things that look good, but many things that the enemy paints and packages them well, yet these are not real, not the absolute truth. What this then means is that we should clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ, who is the truth. Christ alone is the truth. And unfortunately, the devil is ready and is always already deceiving the world. There are ministries out there that are shrouded in, with deceptiveness. There are counterfeits. However, we are to hold on to the truth which is Jesus Christ and the scripture. Jesus Christ is the truth. The word of God is the absolute truth. The guiding principle, our guiding principle, Keeping in mind that the belt was designed to hold every part of the armor in its place and to guard the soldier on every side. So we must test everything with the gospel of truth. We must check ourselves constantly, check our breaths, fasten, look at how the birth is functioning. That is, test and hold things to the truth which are the scriptures. 
again unfortunately truth is under attack because sometimes it appears as if we want to accommodate every principle in the church of Jesus Christ we want to accommodate every ideology but that is always challenging how can we have two truths in this building as we are seated here how can two things opposite things be the truth but that is what is happening today in the church of Jesus Christ can we as a denomination can we as a church can we as the church of Jesus Christ agree on one principle sometimes it's very difficult is there if there is any one thing that Satan wants us to undermine is the truth of the scripture last week we looked at this scripture I mean um, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 through 7 where the devil attempted or tempted Adam and Eve to deny the truth if you look at that scripture it says now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made he said to the woman did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden the question it said was the test of truth did God really say that did God really say that and every day we are impacted by the same issue where the truth the centrality of the gospel is tested by our own ideology by our own principles if you look at the next verse it says but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden neither shall you touch it lest you should die the only weakness is that that is was not part of God's instruction to our first family but the serpent said to the woman you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil truth under attack this lie is still prevalent today doubt God's word doubt God's word the world modernism defines for us how we should live in today's world instead of Christ Christian principles and values are under attack are redefined and sometimes we use defective interpretation to support those worldviews but on the other hand we are encouraged to stand in the truth to stand in the truth to stand in the truth as this scripture says Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14 stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth that is Jesus Christ fastened Jesus Christ fastened Jesus Christ strapped to our bodies and Psalm 119 says I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you same Psalm 119 the, your word is a lamp unto my feet that is the absolute truth another principle in this chapter that is essential in using the sword of the spirit is the breastplate of righteousness the breastplate of righteousness the breastplate was a central part of the Roman soldier's armor it provided protection for the upper body which contains what the vital organs like the heart the lungs and without bread place a soldier would be asking for death as any attack would instantly become deadly with a strong breastplate the very same attacks become what ineffective and useless as blows glance off the armor the strongest breastplate according to the scripture is what is righteousness we should cover ourselves cover your vital organs with righteousness with that the devil cannot attack and harm us we may experience attacks totally but 
that righteousness will glance off all those attacks. What is righteousness? In Hebrew, righteousness means straight, right. And in accordance with the New Testament teaching, righteousness means a behavior or attitude that conforms to a standard of law or principle. It implies doing things right, doing things accordingly. Righteousness, doing things according to the law of God. And righteousness expresses something about the very nature of God who is right in his nature and is in his dealing with his creation or creatures. That is, God judges correctly. God punishes correctly. And God does everything perfectly, delivering us and serving his people. All God's actions are right and in accordance with his nature as God. They are always right. Righteousness covers purity, integrity, and holiness of God. God is right in dealing with all humanity, and God deals with all humanity on the basis of a standard that is right. That standard is stamped. That standard is the core of who God is. He will never ever do anything wrong. No, not with God. God will not do anything that is inappropriate. God is always fair. God is just, just and therefore righteous. The book of Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 24 says, But let him who boast, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So there will never be any time that Christ or God will be less than just. He is always righteous. And righteousness applies to human beings too. You know, our first parents were created righteous. They were right. That was the standard that God stamped to the core of Adam and Eve. They were right. They were righteous. But because of sin, they fall from that standard. They sinned. But when they sinned, they lost that righteousness. And we have lost that righteousness. We we'll no longer have any righteousness of our own. But the good news is Christ has acquired that righteousness again on our behalf because of the event of the cross. So whoever by faith accepts Christ, Christ has stamped or imputed his righteousness into us. So we are declared righteous on account of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As justified sinners, we are now in right standing with God. That is where we are, as justified sinners. So the bread place of righteousness means that we should always be in good standing with the law of God and good standing with Jesus Christ. Every day, we should stand with Jesus Christ. That is, being in a right relationship with Jesus Christ means we cannot stand alone, but we are called to stand with Jesus Christ. Always stand with Christ in a perfect and permanent relationship with Jesus Christ. This is a union with Christ whereby Christ lives in you and we in turn live in Christ. So we are one with Christ and so we are righteous. And because of that relationship, we are able to ward off all attacks by the enemy. You know, there are times when you will run into someone who might say something that might offend you. But Christ in you, we ward off that. Or maybe we are tempted into something. We are tempted by Christ in you quickly elude us or quickly prompts us to the awareness that we are being tempted. There was a time I used to teach philosophy in a secular institution. And there were times when some of my students would say offensive things about Christianity that will offend me. How am I to react? Because my reaction will determine an action, isn't it? I'll be accused by students for sin. But how am I to react? And 
Some of you might have experienced that when people say all sorts of profanity on the core of what you believe is the truth, how ought we to respond when people offend or talk about your religion or talk about your faith? Oh, sometimes I find it difficult to to listen to offensive language around me. How am I to react? You know, we are not shielded from those comments. We face them. That is when our union with Christ comes into play. We are always out there in grocery stores, malls, when we travel. In other cases, past animosities, if not handled well, keep resurfacing then the breast placed or what? Righteousness. Remember who you are. Remember who I am. That Christ lives in me. That I am a follower of Christ. And I ought to respond with grace. Respond in love. To show that. To point. Or sometimes not immediately. But to stand knowing fully well that I am representing Christ. These and similar issues sometimes affect us to the extent that it affects our spiritual focus. But standing with Christ is very important. Friends in the Lord, the devil is attacking the church of Jesus Christ and attacking us every day. There is evil around us. How can we resist the enemy? We can resist the enemy only on the principles laid for us here by Christ. We do have a righteousness, we do not have a righteousness of our own. So it is appropriate to lean or cover our vital organs with Jesus Christ. Served people of God are righteous through Christ. In essence, this passage is saying, protect that righteousness which Christ has earned for you, which Christ has earned for us. You and I are set apart for Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God dwells in you? That is who you are. That is who we are. Christ's Spirit dwells in us. And an awareness of that help us or should enable us to evoke the presence of the Holy Spirit in us when we are faced with attacks. Also, we should continue to grow in Christ's likeness, in Christ's likeness. That is Christ, by our union with him, lives in us. The goal is that we should grow in Christ's likeness. Every day should inch us towards being conformed to the image of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should also seek to lead or to do the deeds of righteousness. Your action should always conform to Christ's teaching. My actions should always conform to Christ's teaching. How do we do that? There are many ways, but one of the principles, which is the final principle here, is by keeping your heart pure, by keeping my heart pure. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows what? The spring of life. A vital organ is here is what? The heart, the heart, the heart. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the spring of life. I am who I think. You are who you think. Like in a game, such as basketball, the guard, the guard, the guard, the guard, the guard, his role. But more than that, what this scripture says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the spring, the springs of life. We should do all things according to God's own standard. But how do we do that? Asking for the grace to do that, to live. The grace to strap the truth. 
the grace to live in union with Christ as we battle the devil. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. That is our calling, friends, in the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come very humble by your word here. Help us to live righteously for you and engage the enemy. But we know we cannot fight in on our own terms, but with the weapon of righteousness and truth. We ask for the grace to study your word, to live by them, and to ward off evil that surrounds us. We ask that today, too, you will inch us towards being conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Would you please put in us the desire to live righteously, the desire to seek you daily, the desire to walk with you always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and together, all God's people say, Amen. Let's stand for our closing song, please.
Yes, you are the everlasting God who defends us. We are weak, but we have a strong defender, and so we should unite with him. Receive God's blessings and go home in peace. Peace be, t- peace be unto you, friends in the Lord, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord, our Savior, and Jesus, our Savior, Jesus Christ. His grace be with you. His love covers you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And together, all God's people say, Amen. Go home in peace. See you next Sunday. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. The everlasting God.